I thought I'd start out by um, telling you a bit about the backstory of, of the project itself uh, and how that backstory has actually shaped and influenced the backstory of the uh, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park uh, that we set out to tell. Uh, as we said, it says on the tin from the Bronze Age to the Digital Age. Well, I suppose the first thing to say is the groundbreaking is a history project, but it was certainly made in circumstances not of its own choosing. And um, I think those circumstances, which I'll, I'll, I'll describe, um, have shaped its form and contents over the 10 years that it's taken to bring the project to fruition. Um, so um, I suppose the basic germ of the idea uh, started um, about 2012, in fact. Um, it, it came from a book I wrote about the impact of the Olympics um, on its immediate host communities. Um, it's called On the Wrong Side of the Track, and uh, it tries to understand East Londoners' response to the advent of the Olympics on their doorstep in terms of a very kind of an ethnographic account uh, of how they were making sense of the profound social and economic changes taking place in the area since the closure of the docks in the 1960s. My view was that unless you understood their response in that slightly longer duration and trace through in, in some detail on the ground how EastEnders were, were dealing with that, uh, you couldn't really understand how they were responding uh, to, to the Olympics. Well, when I was working on the book, I had the good fortune to meet up with Toby Butler, a Nora historian who's interested in collective memory scapes and who came to the University of East London, where I was, Duckling campus there, to work on a trail around the Royal Docks, uh, which focused really on, on the industrial heritage of the area. So the first version of what became Groundbreakers um, took shape um, in about 2013, in discussion with him as essentially an audio trail drawing on the workplace ethnography I'd done with tunnels and surface workers uh, during the dig design and demolish phase uh, of the site construction and linking this back to the site's rich industrial and labor history. Um, and we're very grateful that Toby has stayed the course and played a major role in putting together the online guide. Then by another stroke of good fortune, I heard a talk by Jonathan Gardner who'd been involved in the archeological dig of the site and whose sense of its history went back, not just to the industrial revolution, but to the bronze age. And we were also rather excited by his notion that archeology span wasn't just about unearthing material um, uh, culture of the ancient or pre-industrial past and putting it, and putting the artifacts in glass cages. He, he rather saw archeology span as a much more present tense live engagement. Um, engaging not only with the present and as I said, citing its meaning, but also its future. Um, and he's recently published a book um, uh, about that. And both Toby and Johnny will be discussing their work on June the 29th in a follow-up webinar to this um, about, about issues of uh, how you represent uh, history, environmental history. So at this point, we came across the work of Juliet Davis and her research into the factories, workshops, and small businesses which had inhabited the site and which were dispersed in order to make way for the Olympic Park. Her book, Dispersal, is full of wonderful photographs and emphasized the importance of adding a visual dimension to the story. As an architectural landscape historian, she's added an, a major thread to the story, and uh, I'm delighted that she's going to be talking to us in a moment uh, uh, about that work and showing us uh, some of it. Then one day early on in, in, in putting this together, we went for a walk around the perimeter of the new Olympic site, you know, all surrounded by boards, boardings, with Bob Gilbert, who's an environmental historian, who told us the story of the area's rich fauna and flora and how its ecology had both shaped and been shaped by human manufacture. And uh, I'd already actually read his book on London's Greenway and um, his more recent book, Ghost Trees, um, you know, has this capacity to weave together the strands of natural and cultural history into a quite unique amalgam of observations. And again, we've been very influenced uh, uh, by his work and we realized that it was important to shift away from a totally anthropocentric perspective in, in telling this, this story. We needed to trace the complex interactions between the human and non-human environment uh, in creating the landscape we were walking through. Um, and I suppose that, that shift in perspective has of course been uh, underlined in, in the interviewing period of this 10-year period uh, 
um, you know, by the much greater awareness of, of climate change. And in fact, one recent study, I think it's just been published today, um, uh, shows that if trends continue unabated, by 2050, most of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park will be underwater. So uh, that should, uh, should give us some pause to thought. And again, I'm delighted that Bob is able to join us uh, fresh from one of his inimitable walks around the park uh, to look at some of those issues. So I suppose we should say that what's emerged from this collaboration is something that none of us individually could have uh, achieved, uh, but it has created some common ground in terms of the kind of story uh, uh, we wanted to tell. Um, and I suppose there are a series of questions which I think we might um, address, uh, perhaps particularly in the latter stages of this evening and in discussion. Um, questions like, um, what are cities for? Who are they for? Is it the case, as the then mayor of Newham famously put it, the Olympics coming to East London meant that everyone's a winner? Or if there are winners, when a city becomes Olympified, are there also losers? Is accelerated gentrification the inevitable concomitant of this kind of mega event net regeneration? Or is a genuine redistribution of life chances possible? Um, and you know, quite a, a number of our, our panelists uh, this evening have actually research those questions and address them um, in a number of books and I'll be able to draw on that material in their presentation. Um, we're especially also glad that Claire Meluish, who's director of the UCL's Urban Lab, and who not only supported the development and piloting of Groundbreakers, but has played a leading role in focusing some of these issues around questions of heritage and placemaking, and has recently brought together a very interesting collection of essays on the topic. I'd have to say that because I've got an I've got an essay a chapter in the book, but anyway, uh, Claire will be talking a bit about um, about that work uh, uh, at the end. So I suppose our aim uh, in bringing together you know these different perspectives, um, you know, an archaeologist, an oral historian, um, uh, an architectural historian, uh, an urban ethnographer, um, and an environmentalist. Um, uh, we did converge on a, on a kind of common approach. Um, and I think it's one that uh, certainly challenges one dimensional readings of the site's history. Um, we wanted to challenge the notion that this history is a seamless web of transitions from pre to post industrial enterprise. We wanted to present a more complicated and interesting account, one that focused on discontinuities as much as continuities between past, present and future. So groundbreakers uh, came to evoke for us not just the environmental cost of fossil fuel capitalism and smokestack industry, of course, which was so concentrated in this area, and we'll be hear hearing in a moment from Jim Clifford about that, but the qualitative step change in East London's social structure brought about by the transformation of Stratford and its environments into a hub of the global digital economy. Um, now, one of the, the, the uh, I mentioned that uh, Juliet's work uh, uh, emphasized to us the importance of having a, a, a visual uh, strand to the story, not just an audio. Um, and through various vicissitudes, which I won't now go into, um, about five years after we got the original grant from the Heritage Lottery uh, 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 Trust, um, uh, the, the project ran to a halt, basically because the, the the organization we were working with who held the grant um, uh, went bust and, and took most of the grant with it. So by 2018, almost, we were, we were back to square one. And fortunately then we met up with um, Atif Ghani and uh, Hyperactive Development, uh, who had an idea for making an immersive trail around the Olympic Park. Um, and so we kind of teamed up with them. We concentrated, the Living Maps concentrated on uh, producing the online guide and Atif and his team uh, are focused on, on the trail. And we're delighted that a member of that team uh, is on the panel today, Jim Clifford, who will be talking about his own research into local history. Um, and uh, he, he's published a, a very important book on West Ham and the River Lee. And he'll be saying something about, about the, how the uh, trail was put together and his, his role in that. 
Um, so it's been a bit of a bumpy ride to get across the finishing line. Uh, and to be honest, there were times when I wasn't quite sure I'd lived long enough to see it happen. Uh, but anyway, it's happened. Uh, the, 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 the trail is there, the, the, uh, uh, the online and guide is there. And uh, so now what we're going to do is to go into a bit more detail and depth uh, into how, how the trail and the guide were put together. So first off, um, I'd like to invite uh, Juliet Davis uh, to, to kick off and to talk to us a bit about, about her research and how that's fed into uh, the Groundbreakers uh, project. So Juliet. Great, thank you, Phil. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to my fellow speakers and panelists, um, and to you all for coming and for bearing with the technological hiccups. Um, normally, one would say that it's great to see lots of familiar faces, and certainly there are some familiar faces here, but lots of familiar names too. So it's great to it's really great to see those. Um, so yeah, so my my research on the history of the site goes back to my PhD, which I did uh, in 2007 to 2011. And um, now we've got another technical hitch, which is that I can't move my slides along, but I'm sure they will move along in a moment. It's probably just the file uploading. So I'll just, I'll just keep trying and I'll keep on talking as I, as I try. Here we go. There it's going. So um, yeah, so following my PhD, I, I, I teamed up with two photographers who pretty much in the same time period that I'd been mapping the site and doing my, 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 my PhD research had been collating an amazing archive of photographs of the site as it had been between 2005 and 2007. So right at the cusp of the redevelopment. Um, so we put together a book proposal which was accepted with Historic England um, publishing and, um, and that came out as Dispersal Picturing Urban Change in East London in 2017 and was funded by the Paul Mellon Foundation for Studies in British Art. Um, and then, as, as Phil explained, I subsequently uh, became involved in the Groundbreakers project. So that has provided a continuity with, um, with, with the dispersal research and my contributions, although they cross over all of the different themes in, in dispersal, have really focused particularly on the industrial history of the site um, and, um, and the sorts of industries, the variety of industries, transformation of industry over time uh, that was there. It's been a fantastic project to work on, needless to say. So um, my talk is going to be structured in, in three parts and it relates to what I've been continuously interested in, which is revealing, at least in terms of this historical dimension of re my research on the site. Um, it's been about revealing regeneration through what was being hidden and erased. So with three key lenses on that, um, picking up on this theme of visibility and invisibility and the kind of uh, revisualizing -vis that photography and archival images that um, I've unearthed and we've unearthed collectively in the context of the Groundbreakers project um, can show. So firstly is documenting landscape at the cusp of, of erasure and contesting in the process the official representation that was so dominant at the time, um, just after the Olympic bid had been won and as the first master plans of the site were, um, for the Olympic legacy were in development. Um, and that was a representation of the site as a wasteland, conveying the idea that there was nothing much there and that whatever had been there was pretty much at its end. Um, the second lens is to do with the site's industrial and labour history to the development of the Olympic site from around 1850 and up until the redevelopment of the site began in 2006. And then the third has been a kind of hidden legacy, if you like, which is what happened to the industries and the other users of the site who were displaced in 2007. Where did they go? Where did they end up? How did they fare over time? So then the first theme, landscape at the cusp of erasure. So um, in fact, the site was far from empty at the time that it was, it was redeveloped. And indeed in the run up to that, there was a very complex compulsory purchase order process that was involved um, 
And in terms of businesses, well, there were 286. They were mostly small to medium scale enterprises. They were highly diverse. Amongst them, they provided 4,976 jobs. There were no empty areas to speak of, and it was not a kind of rust belt. It was not post-industrialization in that sense. For sure, as I'll talk about in a minute, there had been a lot of transformation over time, and perhaps particularly in the period since the 1970s, but there was a continuous reoccupation of the site, a reuse of buildings, redevelopment piecemeal um, um, over the years. There were not, not all industries were manufacturing industries. Um, I'll talk about the full range of those industries in a moment. There were really interesting communities of industry that, that, that I discovered by interviewing um, a lot of the businesses right at that moment, just before they were all dispersed. Um, there were also 1,500 residents on the site at the time, um, and they were in particular clusters. There was a, a, a cooperative housing development um, just next to it. There was a group of travellers, um, and there was another gypsy encampment um, just over the other side of the River Lee. There were also all sorts of different cultural spaces. There was a very large church. In fact, I think it was one of the largest churches of its kind, Pentecostal church in, um, in the UK, if not in Europe. Um, there were allotments and there were a range of other um, social spaces of one kind or another. So really it was a fascinating place. Um, although that's not to say, that's not to romanticize it in, in, in any way. So of, of the firms, these are just some kind of generic descriptions that give a, a, a bit of a flavor of the diversity. But of course, within each of these categories, there were lots of particular, particular firms. So there was quite a lot of diversity within each of these categories. So there were product manufacturers, there were construction firms, carpentry and craft firms, wholesale trade, uh, food production, textiles and clothing, paper and printing, motor vehicles, waste and recycling. Um, and this is just an excerpt of one of the maps that I drew at that time, um, because it was quite intriguing mapping a place that was literally about to disappear. So anything that wasn't captured at that, that stage wasn't going to be able to be captured subsequently. Um, so this is just one example of the product manufacturers. There were a number of, of glass making firms, um, mostly involved in just assembling components that had been made elsewhere, so making double glazed units. Although this one was an exception because this was a firm that went back to the 18, uh, to the 19, uh, very early 19th century, uh, not, not all continuously on this site, um, but it had been making glass, including gas lamps and so on, since, um, since that time, and now was doing quite a lot of conservation work, and it was called Bowden and Son. And then there were textiles, yeah, textiles and clothing. Um, so this is a firm that um, on the left here that made and altered sheepskin jackets. And then another firm on the right that was making net curtains. And there were all sorts of other firms too, doing duffel coats and uh, leather belts and, um, and, and, and so on. And then there were, as I said, carpentry and craft firms. And these are photographs from two of those firms both of them engaged in scenery building work, one of which was for the Royal Opera House. Um, so that was a fascinating environment when I visited. There were various pieces of sets and models of sets in, in at various stages of, of development and with paint, paint just all over the floors and walls, a really creative environment. Food production and services, again, there's quite a wide range, but this is this is one that those who know the site from that time will, will probably be familiar with, which is HFH Foreman and Sons, the salmon manufacturing firm that is now just located the other side of the border of the site. It's unusual in having been relocated so close by where many of the firms were, were as I'll show you in one of the maps shortly, were distributed far and wide. And then paper and printing, this was a firm here on the left called Capital Print and Display um, that were doing very large format prints and posters. Uh, and here are some images on the left and right um, of, um, of, of some of those kind of spaces. Uh, and they ranged again from smaller to bigger firms. I think one of the printing firms was one of the biggest firms on the site employing around 100 people. Um, as I've intimated already, they were firms uh, that had different kinds of 
histories of affiliation with the site. One of the things that I found notable when I studied all the compulsory purchase order documents um, was this kind of sense that the firms didn't have a close affinity with the site, that often they hadn't been there for very long, that they were kind of passing through, um, that they were either fading out um, or that there wasn't really much holding them to the place. Um, and it was certainly clear that many of the firms had been on the site relatively recently, but that wasn't to say that they weren't uh, historic, that they weren't old firms, some of which had been handed down over generations of the same family. So Bowden, which is a firm I've already mentioned, was a glassmaking firm that was founded originally in 1800, I think it was in Highgate, and, um, and it produced, as I mentioned, curved glass elements for shop fronts, cabinets, globe lamps for gas lights. And it even made in the 20th century the anti-sun panels for Seifert's and NatWest Tower. And then H. Foreman and Son um, began life in 1905. And um, their family had a history of having, of having fled the pogroms in Ukraine to become established in the East End Jewish community. They moved from Ridley Road to Hackney Wick and then eventually to the site. So they're an, an example of an old firm that moved with London's transformation and gradual expansion. So really fascinating stories. And these were by no means the only two who were of this kind. And where looking through the histories of these firms, you could see how they'd adapted over time to um, other aspects of London's changing economy, changing demands, changing markets. It was clear also in the photography that, um, that Deborah and Marion took really helped to reveal this. It was a landscape that had developed and been adapted through time. Um, it wasn't all high quality landscape by any means um, or uh, revealing examples of high quality architecture, although there were a few that were interesting and one or two of those that are still on the site now, like King's Yard, which was a former sweet factory. So some of this is still there. Um, and a lot could be pieced together about the site's past, certainly through the better and poorer quality buildings and the pattern of how they had developed and replaced earlier structures through time. So this image on the right was a form of hot drying space. I can't actually remember what it was being used for at the time, but it had, looking back through old maps, it had had a whole range of different uses. It was quite intriguing. And looking inside, there were remnants of, of, um, of bits of machinery that had, that, that, told interesting stories about those different uses and the different manufacturing um, activities that had gone on. So for me, this aspect of it has always revealed regeneration as concerned with the transformation of London's economy from industrial to post-industrial, um, as though that's a kind of neat transition. Uh, this has bound up with a view of industry, specifically of manufacturing as dead or dying um and as connected to low skilled poor paid poorly paid labor uh to deprivation in east london um, and therefore if you like part of the problem um it's also regeneration is concerned with a particular image of regenerated place and that's very much the kind of image of regenerated place that we see on the park today um but leading in the process to the labeling of the site as it was as a wasteland um, it's, it was less concerned, or its regeneration is less concerned, therefore, with the diversity, the multiculturalism, and the continuity of industry and enterprise in East London, and the kind of histories that come along with that, or that are entangled with it. And then I'm this little, this next section is going to be shorter because I'm aware of aware of time, but um, uh, so this is my second lens, the kind of invisible history. Um, focusing on the making of an urban edge land. Um, because indeed, as I'll show in one of my maps in a moment, uh, the site was right at the border of London, right up until 1965. And so that kind of being at the border really shaped how it developed. And one of the key ways that it that, that happened was through um, the Metropolitan Building Act of 1844, which applied to land within the boundaries of London. And that um, ruled that offensive trades could no longer be located within 50 feet of dwellings. Now, London was very heavily built up at that time already, and industry was typically uh, woven in complexly with housing. When you look at maps of that time, it's really very closely integrated with all sorts of health issues um, that came along with that. So the effect of that was to drive these kind of firms. So 
They included lovely sounding things like blood boilers, bone boilers, soap boilers and the like. East, where they benefited from cheaper land, lower rates, proximity to in rail infrastructure, water um, and a growing labour force of people migrating to London. Um, so some of those firms are depicted here. So from some of the amazing photographic archives that are kept at Newham Archives. So um, T. Harris and Sons tallow treatment plant, the image at the top here, which is actually in the Groundbreakers website, Hemingway's insecticides and fungicides, um, and G. Rice's fur dressing and dyeing works of 1910, or the photograph at least is from 1910. It wasn't all, I mean, I, I think one of the things that's, that's, that's constant about the site is complexity. Um, so no sooner do you try and describe the site in a particular way, then it reveals all sorts of exceptions. And that's certainly true of the time just before the Olympic redevelopment. It's probably true of the site now as well. And it was true in the 19th century too. So alongside all those smelly, noxious, toxic industries, there were others that were much more fragrant. Um, one example being the Clanico Works, which is in that, that building that I refer to as King's Yard a, a few slides back, established in 1872. It made all sorts of sweets, um, some very well known like humbugs, jellied candies, jams and chocolates. Um, and these are some of the images from the Metropolitan Archives in London um, of, of other kind of activities that were involved and the people that were employed, many of whom were women, actually. Um, and then this is a little bit later. So this is into the early 20th century at Carpenter's Road, which was a, a, an absolute hodgepodge, densely packed with um with with industries typically focusing on printing and um uh, the production of print inks and dyes of paints um apparently the, the the road itself carpenters road used to run blue with the with with all the the ink runoff from from these industries so then just um there's a kind of gradual taming of the site that i that, or as, as i see it that actually doesn't begin into the year 2000 with the london plan and then the earliest plans for the olympic park but actually begins around the, the, the in 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 the war time period in around 1942. so um industry evolved continuously through the pre-war and post-war period um, but the area became a focus for planning in the 1940s through the Abercrombie plan, the County of London plan, and then subsequently the Greater London plan, and the kind of decentralisation strategy that was involved relating to industry in particular. Um, this boundary that is very clearly marked here as the boundary of London, the boundary of the boroughs, um, disappeared from 1965, became an old boundary, a kind of legacy boundary that was inscribed more in terms of the uses and patterns of inhabitation of the site rather than through actual an actual boundary. So as when Greater London was formed, that boundary disappeared. Um, and then, of course, the effects of globalization, um, uh, the end of Britain's empire and, um, and other forces led to the departure of many of the older firms and bigger firms, indeed, in the 1960s and 70s. But the area was reoccupied again. Um, it was never really vacant, typically smaller, more diverse, firms moved in, there was more emphasis on waste and recycling for sure, um, but this ongoing complexity, a mix of older and larger firms. And then in 2006, of course, the dispersal to create space for new growth industry and enable regeneration. And these are two of the images from um, the Abercrombie and Foreshore County of London plan that highlights that. Um, so you can see in the dark blue here um, on the right of this um, image here on the right uh, where the Lee Valley is and how it relates to um, the Isle of Dogs. Um, and that was a really key focus for trying to bridge that old divide between inner East London and, um, and what had been West Ham and Stratford. And that was driven forward as a, as a goal into the early stages of planning for the Olympic Park. So then, you know, what, for me, some of the things that this reveals about regeneration is kind of regeneration as bringing to fruition a vision of ordering or taming the old London periphery that had been established in the decades previous to um, the year 2000 and, and, and to the early days of the Olympic planning process. So addressing perennial issues of connectivity, of pollution stemming from all of those industries, um, which I think Jim will talk about a bit in a moment, of lack of density, 
and of a kind of curious land use mix that was a legacy of that, um, of that 19th century development. And regeneration as hiding rather than telling the story of London, of London and the UK's broader industrial past with all the smells and uprisings, health issues, politics, entrepreneurialism, dynamism, dynamism and colonial legacies and so forth that are all part of it. And that is really clearly key to what Groundbreakers has been doing. And then the third, I've only got two slides for this, um, but, uh, but there's a sense of uh, the legacies that are out of sight and out of sight in that second sense of out of the place as well. Um, a kind of legacy that's been much less talked about than the leg legacies within the park itself that had been materialising so continuously and rapidly since 2012. So this is the map that I originally produced as part of my PhD um, in 2008 that depicted the firms as they'd been dispersed outwards in lots of different directions, like a big starburst, some of them moving out of London, many moving north and east, south in Lee Valley, um, but the majority moving further east to new industrial areas um, in more peripheral and cheaper locations um, in, in east of the Lee Valley. 12% of the firms closed, 9% of the firms at that stage were unknown, wasn't clear what was happening with them, and the rest relocated. Um, by 2015, there was a different picture. By then, 31% of all of those firms had closed. Clearly, lots of different factors shaping them, but certainly one factor which emerged through the interviews that I did at that stage was the rising cost of industrial land in London and the shrinkage of industrial land in London as a result of the kind of pressures created through the London plan. And that's something that has clearly been talked about quite a lot and recognised since, but not in time to save some of the kinds of industries that were on that site. It was also clear that closures were unevenly distributed across different business types. Printing, motor vehicle repairs were really hard hit. Also textiles and clothing, which after all were one of the primary industries of East London um, in the early 20th century. And also wholesale and food, with a few like H. Foreman and Son finding a way to, to survive and thrive um, despite challenges. So just to wrap up then, and I'm going on to pink now, just to try and marry in with the uh, the lurid pink that's been used for some of the text in the Groundbreakers um, uh, publication and, and, and the website. Um, but clearly the Lower Lee Valley is a complex place of intersecting and challenging histories. You know, it would be wrong to romanticise the site pre-Olympics pre and also wrong in my view to, to uh, dismiss it and to not recognise its importance for understanding the history of London. Um, much was hidden within the accounts of the site as a wasteland, a bit like the tabula rasa of the site itself. It flattened um, that history and, and, um, and that history now, of course, is including what it was right at the cusp of change. Um, related to that official decline, wasteland narratives at the time, way too simple. Industry was diverse, much of it was thriving. There were much big, bigger forces at stake and perspectives on what regeneration should entail and, um, and where it should go. Um, and then I think really tying into what Phil was talking about before, there are issues of how histories, the heritage of margin, more marginal places are represented and treated in the context of regeneration. All too often it's dealt, dealt with by sweeping them away, um, as well as how industry is evaluated and people treated in the context of CPO and redevelopment process, processes. So groundbreakers is, clearly an important retrospective attempt to address these kind of issues. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Juliet. Well, I think you've, uh, you've definitely gone around the houses <laughs> in terms of introducing, you know, the various themes and issues that we're, we're trying to address in Groundbreakers and given some, some more depth and context to those. And I'm sure a lot of those issues we return to um, in the discussion. Um, but now, uh, uh, Bob Gilbert, Bob, I'd, I'd like you to uh, to come in, and um, uh, Bob is uh, amongst amongst his many other attributes, a stand-up comedian, someone who's been actively involved in environmental issues, who's written um, marvelously about them. Um, he's also a director of the Living Match Network, um, and has been uh, been an important source of. Uh, 
of rethinking, I think, on, on our part in terms of uh, what living maps could, uh, could and should be doing. So, Bob, over to you. Thank you, Phil, um, and, and, and thank you, Juliet. Um, I should say that without any previous collusion, some of what I'm going to say in a very different sort of approach is actually going to uh, echo what Juliet uh, was saying. Anyway, um, I should also say that in my case, it, it's me that's the technical glitch. Um, I've never been confident with slides or screen share or any of that stuff. So you are just going to get me talking at you. Um, so you just get my face or if you can blank it out, you can do that too. Um, in his introduction, in his very flattering introduction, and I mean the first one and not the second one, Phil called me an environmental historian. Um, it's not a label I've ever had applied to me before. I quite like it though, Phil. Uh, it's probably a grander one than I'm used to. Um, but it does uh, indicate that my interest, my particular interest is not just natural history, it's the history of natural history. It's, it's in particular the cultural associations that we have um, with the plants and animals with which we share our space. Um, the names we've given them, the medical, magical, edible uses we've put them to, the, the, the stories we've told about them, uh, how we've assisted in their distribution, uh, and in particular, what they tell us about the local. And uh, working from that perspective with Groundbreakers, I, I've almost come up with another title, it's just occurred to me, but like almost thinking myself now as an archeologist of natural history. Uh, and I thought I'd start with an example of, of what I mean by that. Um, this, this area that we've been studying, the lower Australia era, this, this was huge spreading marshland with great open skies, uh, grazed by cattle, extending all the way from Walthamstow down through Hackney, Stratford, Bromley, Bow, Poplar down to the, as you heard, down to the Isle of Dogs. It, it was an area where land and water met and where the boundaries between them were often uncertain and continually shifting. Um, it, it, it was threaded by the bow back rivers, which eventually came together to form this last looping mile of Bow Creek into the Thames. And this sort of landscape had its own characteristic ecology and in fact, its own characteristic tree. This is the point where I probably wish that I did have slides actually, because it had this one particular tree, um, the black poplar, our native black poplar. This was the typical tree of the English lowland river landscape, and it was predominant here. And it's, to me, it's a kind of um, ruggedly handsome, quite unruly looking tree, often, often leaning in age, as do I, incidentally, uh, 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 with a deeply furrowed black bark. Um, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just ornamental. This was a tree which was interwoven with the lives of the people. It was pollarded for fuel, for fencing, for winter fodder, for the cattle. Its timber was, is fire resistant, so it was used in the many dozens of tidal mills which fringed the lee then. Uh, it was used for the, the, the areas that were most vulnerable to fire. And it was a tough wood, so it was used in, in cogs in the mill working. So it was wound up with the lives of the people. Now that tree, as I say, once the commonest tree of the English lowlands, has become England's rarest native tree. So one of the things I was interested in was, was could I find relics or remnants of reminders of this tree in the area? And in fact, there, there are several. I mean, first of all, it gave its name to a whole area, the area where I happen to live. Incidentally, so poplar actually drew its name from the predominance of this tree on those marshes. And I found locally also resonance of that in, in local bits of writing and in local poetry. Uh, but the Lee Valley also holds some of the last strongholds for this tree. So there are remnant populations of this tree in the Wick woodlands and along the course of the Old Lee um, on the uh, western side of Hackney marshes. So there were still relic populations of this tree. Um, it still had a, a, an imprint on the landscape, which kind of brings me to the Olympic Park, really, because here was an opportunity with the huge landscaping exercise that was going on was to, to restore this tree to its old and natural habitat. Um, as, as you heard at the, at the beginning, I, I led as part of this program, I led a walk last night, and I have to say it was, it was a, it, we had a very good time. It, it was a beautiful evening. 
the weather was beautiful, the mullein, in the sandman, the bed straws, the bugloss was all in flower, the lime trees were draped with their blossoms, the birds were singing, we saw um, holly blue butterflies and, and a hummingbird, hawk moth, there was all sorts of goings on, uh, which was really good. But I, I, one of the things I charged the walkers with was to see if we could find any recently planted, I mean, the last 10, 20 years, black poplar. And, and the good news was that we did. That the, the native black poplar has come back to the Lee Valley. The bad news is there wasn't nearly as many of them as I think there should have been. And this kind of highlights the sort of approach and the questions that I've been thinking about uh, in our work and with regard to the ecology and the biodiversity of the Olympic Park redevelopment. If you remember, this was going to be the greenest Olympics ever. If, if I quote from their material, it was going to have, oh, it did have 4,000 trees, 150,000 perennials, 300,000 wetland plants, 15,000 square meters of lawn, and to create 12 different habitats. And it was going to make a magnificent spectacle. And indeed it did. I, I went to some of the Olympic events, some of the you know, more obscure hockey matches between Lithuania and Kazakhstan or whatever I could get tickets for. But um, it, it was actually a magnificent spectacle at the time. But there are big questions around it. And, and the questions are things like, how much was that based on or tied in to the existence ecology, existing ecology? And how much was it just um, a short-term display and amenity? Did it enhance or did it replace the local? And how sustainable will it actually prove to be? Um, and that's where I, I, I move ahead to, this, to, to the industrial uh, period um, and echo some of the things that Juliet was saying, because I, I knew this area before the Olympics. I, I knew it um, as, as a sprawling and fascinating area of depots and workhouses and warehouses and car workshops and breakers yards and small enterprises and community endeavors and, and allotments. And part of the pre-Olympic narrative, it seemed to me, was the, was the, in order to justify the suspension of normal planning procedures, the massive compulsory purchase, the relocation, and the disruption that you've been hearing about. Part of the narrative became the depiction of this area as in a state of dereliction, a wasteland, a kind of post-apocalyptic wasteland, one that had not been out of place in some sort of zombie movie. And that applied to the infrastructure, it applied to the people to some extent, but it was also applied to the ecology of the area. So ecologically, this was also depicted as a completely sterile wasteland, as a kind of environmental desert. And what I would argue is there were actually two important habitats that were actually completely displaced by the uh, Olympic generation process. One of these um, concern, concern the river, but the, up to the Olympics, the River Lee was tidal, a, a lot and way further up its length. Uh, for the Olympics, it was deliberately dammed at three mils, and I, I would suggest that was to create marinas and to, and to make more saleable riverside properties. But the result of that was the total loss of tidal mudflats. Now, mudflats. Now, in biology, the in ecology rather, the stronghold of biodiversity is the is is where places meet. It's the margins of things, and mudflats as places where water and land mingle are extraordinarily rich in biodiversity. They support uh, all sorts of mollusks and burrowing worms and invertebrates and insects, which in turn, in turn support birds and bats. So you had the complete loss of that and, and a big impact, of course, on migratory fish, which depended on coming further up the river to reach their spawning grounds. That was one habitat that was lost. And the other one um, was what are now commonly known as brownfield sites. So contrary to, to expectation and to their depiction, these kind of um, wasteland sites are actually rich, have a rich ecological status, but they're rich in, in mosses and lichens, they have their own flora. 15% 15, 15 of all our rarest invertebrates are found on brownfield sites in this country, and they even have their own bird, the black red star. And, and as a relatively local person, I used to walk these sites, and they, I saw sandpipers on the river and Angelica on old lock gates, 
pheasants on the allotment sites, campions, melilo, toad flax, and all sorts of things in bloom. And it even had its own real speciality. Uh, this is going to be my, my second example. I wish I had a slide for this. is a plant uh, called the dwarf elder. You, you may be familiar with the ordinary common elder with its white panicles of, of flowers, a, a plant which is really important in our folklore, both for good and for evil. Um, this, this plant, the dwarf elder, it, is, it, it's not a, a, a taller woody plant. It just comes up uh, from the ground each year, but with the same white panicles of flowers. And this, it, it's a much scarcer plant. And yet for some reason, this part of East London was actually its stronghold. Um, and it had all sorts of fascinating links with the area. The, the dwarf elder had lots of older medical uses, and it was often grown in monastic grounds. So there was a suggestion that it had actually been cultivated in the Abbey of Stratford Langthorne, which used to stand on the west bank of the Lee there, and that it had survived in the area from that time. But there was another fascinating story that it has another name, this plant, and the other name is the Danewort. And the folklore that grew up around it was that the Danewort sprang up on the ground which had been sprinkled with the blood of slaughtered Danes as they were, as they were driven back by King Alfred. And interestingly, in 895, the Danes had actually, the Vikings had actually sailed up the Lee. They defeated the English, uh, sorry, the, the Saxons at the Battle of Millfield, and they'd sailed on up to Ware, and they'd sacked Ware and were occupying it. And King Alfred um, had the idea of bringing, uh, digging drainage channels, which would lower the level of water in the Lee. And he did that, which stranded the Danes further uh, north at Ware, and they lost their, their, their advantage and their maneuverability, and then he was able to defeat them. So the Danes were actually defeated in this area where the Danewort sprang up in East, East London. Um, that's the folklore about it. In actual fact, the, the name, the Danes, comes from something else. It, it actually is an old word for uh, the runs or for diarrhea, not to put too fine a point on it, and, and because that's the consequence of eating the berries of this plant. So it's a final nice local irony that the real stronghold of this plant now is along uh, Joseph Bazalgette's North London sewage outflow. That plant now grows on top of a sewer. So here was a plant which was um, a scarce plant which was local to the area which had all sorts of wonderful both uh, folklore and local associations. And we had at the time of the Olympic development, the strange irony that this plant was being bulldozed uh, out of existence so that we could create wildflower meadows in its place. And that to me was one of the great ironies of, of the Olympic development. Um, uh, like Julia, I, I don't want to romanticize really the, the pre-Olympic site. Um, but it does, it does raise questions about the way that development is done, uh, the questions of whose benefit, who benefits from it, and in what way should we conduct it. Um, and I've talked about some of the losses of the Olympic Park site, but I do want to, you know, I do want to recognise that there were gains as well. Among some of those habitats, there are, you know, I really appreciate the new areas of wetland. And if you go down to those, you'll see herons and egrets feeding there. Now, I think the more natural banks of the Waterworks River and stretches of the Lee are really valuable. The reed beds there are alive with reed and sedge warblers. There are some very attractive new woodland areas uh, with aspens, white poplars, birches, ashes. I think when we did our walk yesterday, we actually heard the sound of six different types of warbler as we walked between Pudding Mill Station and the Timber Lodge. Um, the grasslands on the Sewer Embankment are supporting all sorts of wonderful wildflowers at the moment, although I should point out that the, uh, that, that, that the Sewer Embankment there is the one part of the site which is not actually controlled by the Olympic Park Authority. And I really, I really appreciate that creation of, of an ecological thread which runs all the way from uh, Bow Creek through the Stratford site up to Whitwoods and, and Walthamstow marshes. So there are gains 
Um, there is one of those games, though, that I am more equivocal about, and that is the the idea of of creating um, wild meadows, of sowing. It, it, in the propaganda, it was ten an area ten times the size of a football pitch was sown with what? Sorry, a hundred times the size of a football pitch was sown with wild flowers. Now, this idea of sowing wild flowers has become very popular, but you have to emphasize that it's not really a form of rewilding. It is just a modern take on gardening. And, and you know, those wildflower sayings, it wasn't done by a couple of bucolic farmers in smocks going around with, with uh, wicker panniers. It was actually a highly horticultural process. Those plants were carefully tended, regularly watered. They were subjected to something called the Chelsea Cut, all in, all in order to ensure their readiness, their peak readiness for the opening of the Olympic site. Um, they were magnificent, but they weren't wild meadows. And the irony is that wild meadows are really hard to maintain over time. They consist of cornfield annuals and, and, and meadow plants, which depend on a kind of ongoing agricultural regime, which doesn't exist anymore. And without that input, those areas of, of meadows are being replaced by coarser plants, by cooch grass and docks and burdocks and nettles and, and thistles. So it, it's kind of like um, a guerrilla warfare out there, really, as the old ecology of the area actually reasserts itself over what was created during the uh, generation of the park. And we did, again, during our walk yesterday, it's one of the things we looked out for. And, and you find some of those areas now that were once so carefully planted because they're not being maintained in that right sort of way are now being overtaken uh, with great swathes of hemlock and the common mallow and i'm pleased to say the danewort is back the danewort has reasserted itself and is back along the north london sewer outfall so th there have been gains and there have been losses and there are quite a few questions raised i think about the future about how will this site be maintained uh, to five, ten years ahead. Um, is the forms that have been introduced, that, are they going to be sustainable over a longer period? And as also um, Phil alluded to, what is the, what will be the long-term impacts of climate change on this site? How viable really is it to be building such massive development on what is essentially a floodplain? Um, and what will be the long-term effects of damming the river? Uh, and the other thing is, what are the effects of the ongoing development on the ecology of the site? Because what you see there now, uh, what you see there as open space is not all going to be open space uh, over the next few years. There are at least three more large housing development sites to be built within that parkland. There is much less open space than you actually uh, can see at the moment. And those that further development is going to put huge population press pressures on the ecology of the site, huge infrastructure pressures, uh, huge pressures such as light pollution, which really have an impact on the area's ecology. Um, so I just, I, as I say, big issues and big questions for the future. I, I was going to end with something optimistic, and I think I was going to do that because I thought someone from the Park Authority was going to be listening. But I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, there's a, a lot being said at the moment about Rewilding and rewilding, you know, generally seems to consist of leaving an area to uh, leaving whole areas untended to return to their what are thought of as their natural devices. And this rewilding approach, it has benefits, but I don't really think it is the way ahead, particularly in urban areas. Um, Eighty percent of us in this country now live in cities and. The way, if we're going to avert the biodiversity crisis that we're facing at the moment, the sixth great extinction that we're already in, if, if we're going to avert that, we have to find ways not of setting nature aside in separate places, uh, in, in separate parts of the country with humanity and the rest of nature, you know, increasingly uh, separated from each other. We have to find ways of living, working, playing, growing our food alongside the natural world um, we have to find ways of designing our cities where to the mutual benefit of human beings and other species and on the positive side of that olympic 
developments. There are some examples of that, particularly in fingers of the park that run out in some of the surrounding um, housing developments. There are examples of how humans and other species can, we can create areas where they can live alongside each other. So I kind of want to end by, by, by saying that um, I've learned from, from the exercise of looking at this park, and I hope that as a whole we will learn um, how we can best develop these ideas of, of coexistence, and I hope too that the Olympic Park will be learning as it goes forward into the future. So that's what I wanted to say, Phil. Thank you very much, Bob. Well, as usual, you've given us lots of food for thought, and I'm sure some of those, this is hopefully, we've got time, uh, we'll pick up again in the discussion. It did remind me, actually, as, a, as an East Coast sailor, I've made the intimate acquaintance of quite a few mud banks in my time. Uh, but uh, the next time I go aground, I'll, I'll know more to look, look over the side of the boat and maybe find out more about what's going on there instead of while I wait for the tide to rise. Right. OK, well, now uh, our next speaker is uh, Jim Clifford, who really for many years has um, been conducting research, local research uh, in this area, connecting uh, its various di dimensions of particularly of its uh, industrial history and environmental history. And he's played an active role as a, as a member of the, uh, the team that delivered, has delivered the, uh, the guide, the immersive uh, guide with its uh, heritage hotspots. And uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to welcome Jim um, and uh, to tell us about, uh, about his work and how it relates to uh, the Groundbreaker project. Jim. Thank you very much, Phil. And uh, I've really enjoyed those first two presentations. Uh, I've learned a lot. It's really interesting to uh, hear from other people who've been fascinated by this place. I think Juliet and I were doing our PhDs almost in, in tandem, finishing uh, both in 2011. Um, so probably for that reason, we didn't cross paths all that much. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my past research, which is very much focused on the local history of the Lower Lee Valley, West Ham and the River Lee, uh, and my current research, which tries to uh, explore global connections between industrialization in London in the 19th century, with much of it in the same uh, region of East London, and the other parts of the world that were uh, transformed environmentally, uh, supplying raw materials into these factories in, in East London. And so that will culminate with a, uh, an example of one of these story points that we created uh, focused on the Clarnico site uh, in Hackney Wick, uh, where we try to uh, bring the audience into thinking about how uh, the production and consumption of candy connected Londoners to many different locations around the world. Uh, in the late 19th century. So I'll, I'll come back to that at the end of this presentation. So my original uh, research questions uh, were essentially kind of uh, looking at, at these next two pictures I'm going to show you. How did the Lower Lee Valley transform from a rural marshland with limited industry along the high streets? Um, now, I love this photo, but it is worth noting that this was uh, paid for by the uh, train company that was just about to build the train that didn't exist yet. Uh, and I think this is some early propaganda suggesting, don't worry, we're going to build a train. It's still going to be this lovely bu bucolic place. Uh, but of course, it transformed a, a landscape that looked uh, like this across much of the Lower Lee Valley as industry crowded uh, the riverbanks during uh, the 19th century, uh, and especially in the last third or so of the 19th century, this becomes really the center of industry in, in Greater London, something that was missed by a lot of earlier historians who looked at the census of uh, London, uh, which doesn't include West Ham and Essex London, and saw that industry appeared to decline after the 1870s, or in fact, it had just uh, moved and expanded into Essex. Uh, and you have this huge growth of industry that's parallel to uh, many of the uh, medium-sized industrial cities in, uh, in the Midlands and in the North. Uh, it's, it's quite a large city. West Ham by itself 
in the year 1911 with over a quarter million people. And in addition, I tried to kind of engage with decades of, of social history that tried to understand the rise of the Labour Party and, and socialism and the particular form of socialism that it formed in London and other parts of England uh, by exploring uh, to what extent did this uh, environmental context of a, a heavily industrialized site built on a wetland uh, with pollution, all kinds of health problems, how did that shape uh, new demands for representation from the workers of, of West Ham? So that all came together in this uh, book that I published about five years ago uh, with UBC Press, West Ham and the River Lee. A part of this project involved trying to find every factory on the ordnance survey maps that are at a very high resolution, five feet to the mile uh, for all of greater London. Uh, so, you know, Juliet did this amazing work mapping the factories just as they're about to disappear. And I tried to find them uh, just as they were beginning. Uh, and I will share a link at the end of my presentation where you can see an interactive version of this map. But very quickly, uh, that uh, second map from 1895 shows what I was talking about, about West Ham becoming one of the major industrial cities, uh, but one that's generally been forgotten about by historians because it's overshadowed by its enormous uh, neighbor to the West. And so we try and tell that story in uh, our augmented reality presentations that I'll let you listen to here. Works to improve the River Lee for navigation are amongst the earliest such works recorded in the whole country. But canal works proper expanded significantly in the 1700s and the early 1800s during the canal boom, before canals were in turn superseded by the much faster railways. The Limehouse Cut was completed in 1769, providing a more direct route from the Lee to the centre of London, and the Hackney Cut followed, creating a bypass to the meandering stretch of river through the Hackney Marshes. As the Lower Lee Valley became an industrial centre, the Hartford Union Canal in the 1850s linked the Lee to the National Canal System. Locks formed an essential part of these projects and can still be seen and operated today. Uh, just to highlight a, a few of the really interesting factories, Howard and Sons is one of the first new uh, factories that arrives at the beginning of the 19th century. And it's one that uh, kind of planted a seed that I would follow in my research after my dissertation of, of realizing that so many of these factories had uh, connections to the rest of the world. So Howard and Sons makes quinine. Quinine, you need cinchona bark. Uh, to produce it. It originally comes from Peru and then the British uh, attempt to steal the seeds, Clement Markham and others, uh, to bring it to India and Ceylon or Sri Lanka. And in my research I found that this whole project actually fails uh, and it, in the end it's the Dutch that succeed in transplanting it uh, to Java or Indonesia, uh, which becomes the major producer of this essential drug that you need uh, to uh, build these empires in the tropics because it provides some amount of protection from malaria for the, the soldiers and officials that are stationed there. The White House in the background is Luke Howard's house early on. This site at the historic city mills saw the arrival of a new kind of industry at the start of the 19th century. Luke Howard established a chemical factory that quickly became one of the most important drug producers in the 19th century. They refined much of the quinine that allowed British soldiers and officials to live in tropical regions with the high rates of malaria. In the decades that followed, glue factories, chemical works, producing products like sodium hydroxide, printer's inks, dyes, varnishes, joined Howard and Sons at the junctions of the Leeds back rivers and the main road leaving London for Essex. By 1895, factories extended north up the back rivers with a major jute weaving factory. 
Soap works a distillery and more chemical plants hugging the banks of the city mill and waterworks rivers. The rivers were essential in making this region competitive with the northern industry as coal provided all of the energy and it was too heavy to move overland without significantly increasing the cost. So you can hear there in, in the copy that I wrote uh, for that <coughs> augmented reality presentation that uh, Juliet and I might have a small disagreement. I, I think the importance of uh, the transport of coal far outweighs the jurisdictional uh, freedom to have obnoxious trades in West Ham. That, that is a factor, but you only need to look at Bermondsley, which is under the jurisdiction of the London County Council, and before that, the Metropolitan Board of Works, which had an abundance of offensive trades well into the 20th century, to know that it wasn't uh, necessarily enforced if the local business elites uh, were profiting off of, and if it wasn't making rich people uncomfortable uh, with the smells. So I, I think the importance of, of the rivers providing this cheap way to transport coal directly to the factories is really essential to seeing that build up of industry in the late 19th century. Um, but something we're trying to do with this project is to also push people to think about these global connections. And we're going to work on continuing to expand these interactive uh, experiences to bring people from these locations out into the world to the forest of the Andes, to the failed plantations in Ceylon uh, and maybe on to Java. At this point, we have maps showing how the, the supply of cinchona shifts across the world. Uh, but over time, we'd like to explore that even further in these kind of interactive, engaging ways to allow people to explore. And for those of you who are not familiar with augmented reality, uh, the recordings I'm showing you is a chief standing with his phone on site uh, that little table map doesn't actually exist in the world, but the phone make it, makes it look like it exists in the world. And, and we can kind of create these things in front of you uh, using this augmented reality technology. So finally, I want to look at uh, uh, the importance of globalization in the 19th century to make all these wonderful candies that they made at the Clarnico factory possible. And of course, I'm sure we're all aware that we don't grow uh, chocolates. We don't grow coca in, uh, in England or Canada for that matter. Uh, it's grown, grown in, in the tropics. We know the same is true for sugar. Uh, but I think it's really important for people to, first of all, think about globalization as something that didn't start in the late 1980s, but a process that uh, extends uh, back into time and has shaped the world that we live in and these relationships we have with other parts of the world. Uh, and I'm hoping by highlighting uh, some of these kind of invisible connections in history, it's a moment to pause and think about the invisible connections today and maybe some of the environmental consequences of eating chocolate today with the palm plantations in Indonesia uh, that are causing all kinds of environmental harm. In 1881, the British trade journal visited Clark, Nichols and Coombs in Hackney Wick and reflected how it was remarkable that in proportion to the advance of civilization, the demand for the luxuries of life extends and as prosperity increases, so does the desire for these agreeable and toothsome condiments which are made to tempt. And at length, we find what was once a rare treat is now a household requisite. As we look at this model of the expansive factory in the year 1900, we can think about the global connections that made Britain's national sweet tooth possible. They produced confectionaries using coconuts, ginger, licorice root, citrus fruits, and packed these sweets in tin boxes made on site. Large sugar refineries in Silvertown supplied their main ingredient using sugarcane from Fuji, the Philippines, Brazil, and Jamaica. Sri Lanka, then known as Ceylon, exported coconut. Spain provided much of the citrus, while licorice root came from the eastern Mediterranean. British Malaya supplied much of the tin imported in the later 19th century. So the local history of this site is deeply intertwined with the history of globalization. 
in the 19th century that connected East London firms with suppliers all over the world and made it possible to mass produce sweets for the British population and to export these products around the world. So again, uh, in this current version, we use the audio uh, to allow people to think about these global connections while looking at the uh, 3D rendering of, of this, uh, this architecture. But over time, we want to again, extend that so that you can follow that supply chain backwards. And this is something we've done for the timber industry uh, in an exhibit we presented last uh, fall. And we're going to do it this weekend for the uh, flour milling done at Millennium Mills, looking at how that connects actually to Saskatchewan where I'm presenting to you today. Uh, in my academic research, I've gathered all kinds of data so that I can map where things came from. You see the changing geography of sugar as sugar beets become a dominant source and uh, quickly go through Spanish oranges, uh, the importance of Singapore and providing tin or Malaysia. And I'll just leave off with this slide. I'm sorry to say the walking tour uh, has sold out already, uh, but we're going to hopefully uh, eventually launch it as something similar uh, to the groundbreakers where there'll be hopefully permanent QR codes located around uh, Victoria Dock, where you'll be able to go and explore not just the local history, but how this local history connects to the places that uh, we're supplying food into the docks and helping feed Edwardian London. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, well, we look forward to uh, the further development of your, of your projects. Um, and uh, certainly the Royal Docks is a, is a very interesting uh, area to... Uh, Toby Butler actually has already done a, a one trail, low tech compared to, to what you're doing now, but uh, yeah, it's certainly a very interesting area to, uh, to explore further. Uh, so now um, uh, I'm, I'm aware of time. Um, what we've done, we've actually, uh, hopefully we're extending our time a bit because we, we started a bit late and again, apologies for the, the glitches that um, people experience in, uh, in logging on to this uh, event. Um, our final speaker um, is Claire Mellywish, um, who's the director of the Urban Lab at the University College London, um, which is um, uh, a hive of uh, creative and critical industry, I have to say, uh, in, in matters to do with cities and their regeneration. Um, as Claire, as I said, has been a good friend. Uh, she's, she's one of our advisory group. She's been a good friend to Living Maps. And, uh, uh, but I've asked her to, uh, she just brought out this book, which is looking at some issues to do with heritage and placemaking in the world of universities. Um, so I've asked her to kind of, uh, to complete this, um, the panel presentations uh, by giving us her, her thoughts on, on how the Grand, uh, Groundbreakers project relates to some of the issues with which she's currently dealing. So Claire. Okay, thanks, Phil, and I'll try to be really quick. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, hope that's working. Um, yeah, so I mean, I haven't been directly involved with the project um, in the way that the other speakers have, and it's great to hear more uh, detail about how it was developed and, and the content. And um, I think it's a fantastic project. And I just wanted to sort of try and put it into perhaps um, a slightly wider context, trying to think about why it's important in the context of the Olympic le legacy. Um, and as Phil says, um, I have just uh, co-edited co a book to which Phil has contributed a really important chapter, um, which actually talks about the groundbreakers. Um, so this book, co-curating the city, universities and urban heritage, past and future, um, and I've also been writing about the sort of importance of culture and heritage um, generally um, in the Olympic Park and surrounding areas, um, especially post-COVID in terms of, uh, you know, uh, aiding recovery, healing and, and future re resilience in East London. Um, 
as part of that sort of wider regeneration legacy. And so there's another chapter coming out in this book, Lifelines. But just to say a bit more about co-curating the city and, and, and the themes that we're looking at in that, um, this is just a, a sort of edited summary of some of the contents. Um, so you can see that there are a couple of chapters by me and my co-editor, Dean Sully, thinking about the role of universities in these processes and the role of universities in highlighting uh, the importance of culture and heritage in urban regeneration. And then there are two really um, fantastic chapters by Jonathan Gardner and Phil um, that uh, specifically engage with the UCL East Olympic Park um, context and um, the, the, the processes that have occurred there and the um, inception of the Groundbreakers project. So if you want to read more about it in a sort of academic book, um, you can download this book for free online at UCL Press's website or, or buy it and um, uh, yes, refer to chapters seven and eight, especially Phil's chapter eight, um, which uh, describes the, some more of the background to the Groundbreakers project. Um, so I just really wanted to sort of quickly kind of run through, yeah, some of that context. And um, yeah, I suppose just to mention that, though, that th those publications have grown out of a whole series of workshops that we organized at UCL that included people like Phil and Jonathan and also included um, a couple of kind of community focused workshops uh, that were funded by UCL East uh, that were connected with the Groundbreakers project when it was um, in the development phase. Um, and that was very much against, against this background of these big regeneration promises that were being made that had kind of um, uh, you know, come into being with Boris Johnson's invention of uh, Olympicopolis as an element of the Olympics le Olympic legacy, um, which then evolved into the culture and education quarter of which UCL is part, and then became East Bank under Sadiq Khan's mayoralty. Um, and that's what we see emerging today at Stratford water, uh, Waterfront with those big national institutions like Sadler's Wells and the VNA coming to the park. Um, and I think it's interesting to remember that, you know, in fact, culture and heritage hadn't really been written into the original Olympic legacy promises, even though during the 1990s, um, during those earlier debates about the regener regeneration of East London, um, East London's uh, rich kind of cultural and, and, and heritage resources and potential and its very um, and its immense kind of cultural diversity had been highlighted as something that should be um, sort of drawn on and and drawn attention to um, and so yeah it's kind of interesting then to understand how you know with the um, staging of the Olympics and the creation of the LLDC uh, those I, those sort of early ideas kind of got, seemed to get set on one side and instead in came this sort of rhetoric around a dazzling new arts and culture cluster, forward-looking education and innovation presence um, that would power really the sort of creation of a new knowledge economy to replace everything that Juliet and um, Jim and, and Bob have been describing that existed previously on the park. Um, and, you know, we were kind of interested in engaging with some of the issues that we uh, saw in that as part of, you know, some of the problems of, of large scale kind of top down regeneration and from 2016 to 2017 or so, Urban Lab and our sort of associated research cluster curating the city and the Center for Critical Heritage Studies um, did some research um, amongst local community organizations that kind of revealed that, you know, there was a sense that these developments weren't necessarily in their best interest and that a lot of the kind of funding and resources was being channeled to these big players. And, and really kind of jeopardizing the opportunities 
um, that they had provided for many years for local people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds to participate in the arts. And this, you know, they reported to us that this had really created quite a significant cultural and geographical divide between the park and surrounding neighborhoods. So there's just some of the organizations that we spoke to. Um, and it seemed that kind of, you know, some of those earlier recommendations from the 1990s had been forgotten um, and that the LLDC's uh, program of placemaking, which was shortlisted in 2013 for the UK's placemaking awards was uh, focused very much more on the creation of new permanent artworks by people like Anish Kapoor with the Orbit uh, landmark, which was pictured in my first slide um, and, and the architectural icons of the new buildings on the park. And this was somewhat in contrast to Sadiq Khan's definition of cultural infrastructure around the same time, 2016, as part of his good growth concept, which was a much broader understanding of cultural infrastructure at a sort of micro scale. Um, so the GLA's cultural infrastructure strategy was um, valuable because it really emphasised the importance of using the new London plan to protect these kinds of spaces um, and to protect local heritage from development. And one of the positive effects of that report was the designation of Hackney Wick, uh, west of the park, in 2018 as a creative enterprise zone, which provided some degree of security for small scale live work accommodation in the face of these sort of accelerated development processes. But in 2017, a, a new report from the London Assembly Regeneration Committee also argued that while culture helps boost communities, the dangers of gentrification stemming from culture led regeneration were very real. And so I think we've already heard about some of the problems um, perhaps with the LLDC's culture and heritage strategy, the way that the Olympic Park was kind of dismissed along, you know, with its, its history as an industrial wasteland or a fridge mountain, as it was described, rather than as an infrastructure that was, you know, that supported uh, many livelihoods and social relationships. Um, and Juliet's book is a wonderful record, record of what was lost on the park through the re remediation and decontamination process prior to the Olympics and then with the um, development of the um, Olympic uh, infrastructure. Um, and I think, you know, what's great about Groundbreakers is that it does reinstate uh, through it, um, you know, a site interpretation project, um, much of that uh, heritage in, in another way. It's created a trail of, of digital hotspots across the park, and it allows visitors to, um, to in effect, beam up, um, you know, many demolished landmarks, such as the Clanico Sweet Factory, and access um, historical accounts and local people's accounts of their significance in their lives. And so I just wanted to conclude really with um, a, a sort of a, couple, a few images of the new UCL urban room space that we have been in the process of creating on the park um, uh, over a number of years. And that has, you know, sort of uh, led to us being involved in many of these conversations with people like Phil and the Groundbreakers and, and, and many other kind of community based organizations really to, you know, thinking about the role of our university and other institutions in the process of transformation of the area, in the process of the tran transformation of local heritage in the area. And this new space, um, part of the new UCL East campus is one that we really hope will provide a focus for these kinds of collaborative, public facing and community based um, projects uh, through urban teaching and research and with a strong emphasis on engaging with these um, much more diverse histories, cultures, identities in the local area embedded across um, these transnational networks of migration um, and sort of trade engagement as Jim has been describing. So just to conclude on a, a positive note, I, we hope that this will provide a, a strong focal point for 
um, these kinds of collaborative processes of reimagining the city for the better post COVID and as part of the Olympic legacy. Thank you very much, Chair, for that. Uh, and the up upbeat ending as well. It was uh, good to have. Um, well, uh, we've been running a bit over time. We started late, uh, but we've got about half an hour, I think. Um, and I know uh, seeing the people we've got here, there are quite a number of people who've uh, you know, been engaged in one way or another with, um, with East 20 and the, the development of Olympic Park and so on. So, um, so I think at this point, really, what we want to do is kind of op open it up for, uh, for questions uh, and, and discussion. So, um, yeah, so and then, and then we got some, I know there's been a rather a lot of presentations uh, rich presentations at that. Um, but I, I just wondered, um, for example, I, I don't want to, to embarrass, but I see Gary Winnell is there, who's uh, somebody that I've had conversations with over the years, or maybe he's now just disappeared, I don't know. Um, but um, I know he's written quite a lot about, um, about the Olympic movement and the, the impact of um, the Olympics on, on their local communities. But um, I think it just no, no sooner had I mentioned his name. Oh, no, he's there. He's there. Hello. Hi, Gary. <laughs> I just wondered if you had, you know, listening to all this, if you had some thoughts. It's um, a, a terrific um, event, and I thank all the speakers very much. Very interesting presentations. It's very odd for as many of us in this room, I imagine, have been engaged with this topic since 2003, when um, London first contemplated bidding. And um, I know my collaborator, John Horn, who is also in the room, and I have on many occasions wandered around bits of the Olympic site over the years. Uh, and my reactions are a strange combination of anger and ambivalence, as so often with everything to do with the Olympics movement. Um, anger because of the, uh, the massive waste of resource and ambivalence because I'm all too well aware that within the Olympic movement, within local authorities who work with the Olympic movement, there are both rapacious people who seek to make a quick dollar on fancy developments and very sincere people who seek to advance agendas to do with um, local city development or with um, ecological improvement or with combating climate change. And I think what's interesting about the three presentations, and if I may say so, your own work, Phil, is the engagement with thick description and detail, which is incredibly informative against a tapestry of uh, rather bland posturing. Uh, and so in all sorts of ways, I find there's an awful lot of food for thought here. Um, I was lucky enough in one of the more recent visits to the Olympic Park to walk right across it with Toby Miller, who at the time was actually living on the Olympic Park and had been for a year or so. Um, and that was, of course, a fascinating journey because he had a, the view of a situated resident, albeit an academic middle class one, uh, as opposed to my own of a, as a, an occasional visitor, but a Londoner of some sort of 60 years standing. Um, and when I heard Bob Gilbert's presentation, I thought, yeah, that's one of the bits I really like, is that the parts of the park are a wonderful um, retrieval of potential ecological damage. Uh, and other parts of it are just completely tragic remnants of the attempts to make a buck, which hasn't quite come off, like the, um, the half-finished, half-occupied look East Centre. Um, so, I don't know, I, I say more, more, no more than that, I'm rambling. Uh, anger and ambivalence are my responses, as so often. Well, I think the Olympic dream itself is rather Yes, isn't it? I mean, it had this, it had this utopian elements about uh, you know, bringing the youth of the world together in peaceful competition, you know, but it also has its motto of uh, uh, stronger, higher, what's the other one? Um, higher, stronger, something else. Anyway, if you apply that outside the sports field, it, it leads to environmental destruction and, 
and the greater social inequality. So, I mean, I think the, the Olympic movement itself is split down the middle, really, about, about its, it has its positive, its idealistic side, but also, of course, it's, uh, it's part of a kind of capitalist um, economy. Anyway, right, so, so uh, I just wanted, if uh, I see Debbie's there, um, and I know I, I work with Debbie on a project um, uh, with um, residents of East Village, people who just moved into the uh, ex-Olympic village, and um, De Debbie did a wonderful uh, uh, photography project uh, with some of those residents, uh, and um, I made a video with some of the young people that are talking about uh, what they felt in <coughs> supposedly living the Olympic dream uh, by moving into, into that estate. So I wonder, Debbie, if you'd had any thoughts, um, and I know you've done a lot of work on, on housing issues, uh, uh, in relation to the Olympics, but elsewhere, and I just wondered if you had any any thoughts. To bring to the Hi, uh, hi everyone. Sorry, I can't put my camera on. Uh, camera on, and um, thank you very much for the presentations. They were absolutely great. It's it's really interesting to look at a sort of object of inquiry, if you like, from so many different perspectives. I think that's what's really kind of exciting about tonight's event. Um, and also, I was kind of uh, I was a director of Living Maps at the point when Groundbreakers um, project was getting off the ground. So I was absolutely fascinated to sort of come back and uh, see, you know, see where you've got to. And I can't wait for the I think it's 29th of June when you've got the other online event when you're actually launching the, the map. So I can't wait to see that. Um, and yes, I mean, we we looked at the um, East Village sp specifically in the first couple of years that um, the residents moved in. So we were really looking at pioneer residents and their experiences. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of positive experiences. Um, there were also divides between different groups in the park. There was divides in the way it had been organized in that a lot of the retail, for example, or the kind of um, commercial facilities were too expensive for um, the lower income residents. Anyway, I mean, I'm not really <laughs> presenting the research here, but um, obviously that relates to, I think the big, you know, the big thing about the housing in the park was how it related to the rest of the Stafford area and how, um, you know, it did put up house prices. It did um, sort of accelerate a gentrification process of housing in the area. And so at the same time as this was happening and certain people were sort of, very fortunate to get the housing on the park. Other people were finding um, the property prices were going up and also social housing, of course, was disappearing. And Newham was one of the places where there was a huge amount of displacement of people from the wider area. Um, and I, I, I mean, I could sort of ramble on <laughs> at length, um, you know, I. I suppose one of the things I'd probably like to highlight is the fact that of the affordable housing, which is being rolled out over the park, we really need to keep our eye on, as probably most of you here know, we really need to keep our eye on what, what that, that actually means. Um, so on, on East Village, 24% of the housing was social housing, which was linked to wages. Um, but a lot of the what we call affordable housing on the park is actually shared ownership and sort of intermediate housing, which is really for not even medium income households, really for high income households. And this, this is housing that's subsidised, um, you know, public, publicly subsidised money. So I think, we, you know, this thing about ben who benefits and who doesn't. And actually, I think the policies in Newham generally regarding who access to social housing are better now. But when we were looking at the park, Robin Wales was in place and even the people that was accessing social housing was a kind of quite a strict um, allocations policy where some of I mean everyone who got it you know needed the housing but some of the people most in need um, were, were not getting that that, that property and um, a lot of homeless people or single parents were being pushed out the borough um, whereas for example people in overcrowded might have been getting it so yeah, so even within the allocation of the social housing, there was a kind of divide in inequality. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll stop now. <laughs> uh, it's a bit like a bad presentation. I haven't really prepared, but uh, you get the feel. But it's, it's been really good to be part of this event and sort of, um, yeah. <laughs>
I'm really interested in the park. I'd like to sort of revisit East Village, really. I think it's time to go back and see what's happened now. Thanks, Debbie. Well, I'd say. Thank you. <laughs> nice Sorry, that wasn't really a question, was it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> someone else will have to ask the questions. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was good just to just to catch up and just to. Uh, uh, yes, it's an I check in with a question, Phil. Yes, okay. Oh, we've got we've got somebody who's had their hand up for a while though as sorry. well. Oh, so sorry. maybe we could do, Eldred, do yes. well. We could do Ralph and then and then I think Eldred has got her hand up. Ralph and Eldred. Okay, Ralph. Okay, okay. I, I, I worked in the government at the time of the Olympics as the, I think I was eventually called the Olympic Legacy Regeneration Advisor, believe it or not. And so I wrestled with this problem, never found the answer to it. Why do we think that such a thing as Olympic Legacy exists? What are the processes that an Olympics generates that might lead to social and economic change? This is a question I used to throw to my civil servants, colleagues, and, and I didn't dare put it to ministers, but I'm curious to know what, what, what why do we take it so seriously? I mean, if, if, you, if you've got 8 billion to spend on East London, on the inequality in East London, the last thing you think of doing is probably holding the Olympic Games. Now, I, I accept that subsequently, some quite imaginative things have been done with the Olympic site, with, with uh, what's happening in, happening in Olympicopolis. But that's what else has been done. There was no plans of that sort knocking around. In, in the case of London, Juliet used this term, which really struck hard in me, the, the idea of a regenerated place. The only Olympic ambition we had actually, despite all the rhetoric and so forth, was there would be a regenerated place, whatever that meant. And that's why the image of the place as such a abandoned, desolate area has stuck so firmly to that part and which frustrates us so much. It's essential, it's essential to the whole Olympic shtick of, of Olympic legacy, in my view. Um, I'll shut up there, but I don't know whether I've made anybody, if anybody's got the answer to, why the Olympics should have a legacy. Yeah, we spend nine billion, but it's on a sports park. The very simple answer to that, Ralph, is that you won't win an Olympic bid now unless you include something called legacy and, and what you pack into that. Um, you can say what you like. Yeah. Phil, when we wrote the Olympic bid, the, no one gave any thought to, to how that legacy was going to be. But it, but it was, it's never, the, le the, the London legacy has never, ever been defined. No, no, but it, or, it has to be put in. But I, my question is, what are, the pro what are the social and economic processes which were at play here? I can't find any. Well, uh, no, the whole point about it is that it, uh, it's, a, it's, it's part of the Olympic rhetoric that there should, you know, that this legacy thing should happen. So people attach all sorts of, things to it. I mean, they have this the convergence agenda, you know, this is this, was the people in East London, growing up in East London, um, should have the same life chances as people growing up in Richmond. Or as Boris Johnson and Nippard put it, um, these, when, the, when these young people took to the streets in, um, in uh, 2011, uh, well, if only they spent time on the rugby pitch, they wouldn't have enough energy to riot, you know, I mean, that's the kind of <laughs> as sophisticated as it got, right? So, I mean, one can be Cynical about it. The fact, the fact is, I mean, it was called 2012 the Legacy Games, you know, went up in a puff of smoke. But I mean, uh, just rhetorically, they need, they, you know. It is just rhetoric. That's my point. It is actually just yeah. rhetoric. So I think we um, should, I, I, you know. Be... Yes, okay, we'll. We'll, we'll, we'll let Eldred yeah. in. Uh, Eldred, she's been waiting a long time. To, um, to um, Eldred, who's, uh, who's got a very interesting question. Eldred, are you still with us? in the chat you can hear me can you yep um yes yeah, so i have lived in the area since before the bid was even announced um and it's been very interesting to see it develop and also to see the changes and my question goes back even before i lived here i was fascinated in particular by professor davis's uh, maps of all the industries that moved out of the area and um also, I think this would apply to uh, Professor Clifford and um, uh, uh, Claire's talk. Uh, 
what has happened to uh, the populations around the site who aren't just in Newham, they're also in Waltham Forest, and what have been the movements alongside some of that flight of industry, that movement of industry? Um, has any tracing been done historically or even in the recent past? Well, I don't know, Debbie, do you want to come in on that? I think you've done some work on it and I think Paul's done some work on it, Paul what? Sorry, I was, I was just out of the room. Could you repeat? I didn't sorry, I miss the question, I'm really not sorry. Not, not just the dispersal of, of industry, but the dispersal of people, uh, the displacement of the population in Newham as a result of the Olympics, um, you know, pressures on, on house prices and yeah, I, I, so I'm so sorry I didn't hear the question, but one of the reasons, um, I, so I don't know if this answers the question exactly, but one of the reasons that people who were in most housing need were able to be displaced out of the borough was because in 2011, um, when it was the Localism Act, local authorities were allowed to have um, some sort of autonomy about how they manage their um, social housing waiting lists and at the same time whilst for example homeless uh, people who they still had a statutory obligation to find housing for people who are homeless but they were allowed to um, place them outside the borough into private rented property so whereas previously you would have got someone who was I don't know say a single mother with a family who who desperately needed a home um, would be kind of top of that list for social housing in, for example, the borough of Newham, was then, because of the Localism Act, allowed to be placed into private rented out of the borough. And that happened, basically. And once someone's in private rented for two years, um, the borough can wash their ha hands of that person. Um, so like I say, at the time, it was Robert Wales, who was um, the mayor of Newham, who was very keen on actually used to say things like uh, we don't want any more poor people in the borough uh, so you know actually it's a kind of mixture it was that at that time because that was the time when I was looking uh, doing the study I guess you'd say it was a mixture of um, you know national policy uh, and local policy um, and, and global you know the global economy that the fact that the you know the pressure on the high income high value areas like London the kind of international pressure on um, post-industrial cities where finance is being made through property as opposed to previously industry as we saw. So, you know, coming from a point of view of geography, I suppose it's these different kind of scales that all um, come together at the same time. I I'm really sorry, I didn't hear the questions. I'm not sure if that answered. Um, what you asked, but uh, I'm sure there's lots of other other people I'm sure would like to uh, maybe come in who heard the question properly as well. Thank you. Yeah, I can try really briefly to, to answer it on a, a broad scale that the population of Newham started to drop uh, in the 1930s, I think. Uh, and I think quite a bit of the uh, the population dispersed. This was happening across inner London as the automobile made all of those uh, outer London boroughs more accessible. Uh, when you map it, you can just see a, a dense population explode out uh, into the outer boroughs. Uh, so you see this, this really big drop off. And I think it's a very different population that comes in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, which is outside of my uh, historical research, but I used to spend lots of time in Stratford and the old mall compared to the new mall was definitely focused on a, a demographic of, uh, of newcomers of people from all over the world. Um, I haven't been to the UK since COVID, so I don't know what's changed uh, recently, but I, I expect it's a completely different population that over the past 30 years, there's been this enormous rebound almost to its historical population heights of the early 20th century. And I don't know if, uh, if the work's been done, I'm sure it's in the census data that it, there's a, a much more you know, affluent uh, population as that sort of uh, 
slow march of gentrification east that's been happening for four or five decades now uh, through the Isle of Dogs and beyond uh, has, has brought a very different, uh, probably also quite global population, but an affluent global population uh, into Stratford, but even I think now into Canningtown and Silvertown, the, the redevelopment is spreading, you know, it, it continues its march east. And I don't know whether Brexit interrupts that or not. We're going to have to give it a few more years to see uh, how that process plays out, but it, it's really interesting to watch in real time right now. Okay, well, I, yes, I think uh, the Cockney diaspora has been going on for quite, as you say, quite a long time, but it, it, it's a complicated process. I mean, there's some element of white flight, there's some, uh, there is obviously, I mean, the areas I've researched, um, a lot of people coming in from different part, travel spots of the world um, who are living on low incomes. Uh, it's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated picture in East London as a whole. I think you're right though, in Stratford, um, it, it's a kind of accelerated process. And uh, I think in our, in our study on East Village, I mean, that was an attempt to uh, hold together in, in one estate. I mean, uh, corresponding to the Olympic dream of bringing people from different walks of life and different income levels, uh, in this case, together, different uh, tenure categories, um, <clears throat> you know, to try and create some kind of sense of community. Um, but, but as um, Debbie's pointed out, um, some of these um, uh, social tensions uh, nevertheless reproduced themselves. Um, when we were there, it came around the noise, uh, being the financiers who, who kind of would leave at uh, eight in the morning to go and work in the city but come back and party all night and the, the weekends um that was one sort of noise and then there was also um you know kind of uh, people with largest families had children living on the ground floor who were running around the uh, the courtyards making noise so you, you had all sorts of things being mobilized around around this um I think, but maybe it was also a, a particular moment in the process of, of this particular kind of state and community coming together, you get these kind of sources of friction, but certainly that they, they have been intensified. Um, now, I mean, Claire, you, you were waving your hand at one point, we're going to have to bring this to an end fairly soon, but you, you were waving your hand about at one point. Uh, have you got a thought? Uh, well, I just wanted to respond to Ralph Ward, uh, really, but maybe it's a bit late now. <laughs> but I mean, I do find it quite interesting that somebody working in the government at the time to deliver the Olympics didn't says he doesn't understand what the legacy was meant to be or, you know, how it could work. I mean, I think, um, you know, well, I was not on message. I'm just I'm asking these questions from a spirit of intellectual curiosity rather than what is the process that yeah, leads so to I'm just to trying to that's the point I'm, I'm asking outside my role old role mm. uh yeah so i'm just uh was going to say that there is quite a large literature in uh the academic world of geography and so on about you know the use of big uh sporting events and other kinds of you know cultural events and stuff by cities uh to gen to to drive regeneration uh, by pulling in investment that pays for uh, the, um, you know, for infrastructure, for rem remediation of sites where necessary, for new transport um, hubs and all of that, that then kind of provides the foundation in theory for regeneration legacy to uh, materialize in its wake. And that is something that is a you know, quite sort of clearly documented phenomenon of urban policy and... There, I know all that very, very well. And I okay. just... Well, that's all from more. me. Okay, okay. Well, I think this is, this is obviously a, it's an ongoing debate, but um, um, yes, as, uh, as Claire says, uh, there has been a lot of research and debate on on um, what is meant by legacy, what forms it takes, and the relationship between regeneration and uh, mega events and gentrification. But, as, but I mean, I think we need just to draw this to an end. I mean, first of all, to thank all our pre presenters for, uh, well, first of all, uh, for their support for the project, for their contributions to the project, and their contributions tonight. I think, uh, you know, it's some measure of the, the intricacy and complicated complexity of 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 um of the kind of 
of the limp, what I call limpification, uh, that, that, you know, it actually gen has generated a lot of very interesting work. I just hope that, um, that uh, you know, people visit the park, uh, sample the uh, trail, um, download the, you can go to Living Maps uh, website and download the, the PDF of the, of the, uh, uh, guide you can even if we actually have got some hard copies of the guide um if, if you'd like them you'd have to contact uh probably better contact me i suppose pico in 763 at hotmail.co.uk um and i think for a tenner you can get you can get, actually get the book uh as, rather than just a pdf um and we, obviously we're interested in in sort of feedback from it so if any of you do go um you know go to the park try you know, sample the guides, visit the uh, the trail. Uh, please do get in touch and let us know. You know what you think about it all. Um, and finally, just to say, um, so we've got another event on the 29th, um, in which myself, Toby, and Johnny Gardner uh, will be uh, presenting. Where we're, we're looking, um, really a series of case studies. What, how do we do history? How do we do public history? And how uh, how how did how did we you know, get to grips with um, the complexities of the history of this site. So um, we're going to be kicking that one around um, on the 29th uh, from 6.30. Hopefully we won't be having similar technical glitches. We're not quite sure what, what happens at the beginning of the evening, but uh, we're going to do our best to make sure it doesn't, it doesn't recur. Um, so yes, one final round of thought. Thanks to our, our contributors uh, this evening and to also to those who uh, contributed to the discussion. Um, it's nice to see so many old friends I haven't seen for some time and know that they're still in there kind of, you know, working away at these important issues. So, so uh, I think that's it for this evening. Thank you all for coming and I uh, hope to see some of you on the 29th. So bye for now.